A new year for Rock Island, what the mayor sees as the successes and challenges. And going back more than 50 years when one picture put Iowa and the education system on the national stage. It's all part of the cities. Rock Island is like any city. It's worried about generating enough money while providing the services its residents expect. It's working to expand, adding jobs and improving the quality of life, and it's protecting what it's already got, whether that's safe neighborhoods, growing industries, or up-to-date streets and other infrastructure. So how's it doing? Joining us is Rock Island Mayor Mike Tomes with a State of the City Assessment as we enter 2019. Yes. How you doing? Wonderful. How's the city doing? City's doing well. You know, it always could be better, but uh, it, things have been improving and we've got a lot of positive things happening. Well, I want to talk about that, but what's, in, what's the headline right now? It's uh, not exactly city property, but it's no. sitting on a uh, property that is inside the city. We're talking about the Rock Island County Courthouse. Yes. To explain to me how Rock Island City would get involved in this when it's basically what? A demolition permit. That's exactly. That's all I'll say. That's all it is. Make it sound simple. Uh, that's the only involvement we have in it. Other than that, we do not. Uh, but all demolition uh, projects need a permit. And so the contractor has to come in and submit an application and give the details of it. Um, and so in this case, it's no different. But because it's a historical building, and of course they have to worry about stormwater runoff and everything else, they need DNR approval uh, and along with uh, uh, EPA approval. Um, and they haven't got that yet. Well, let's be honest, the demolition permits don't come to the city council. No, nothing comes, those don't come. Those go to the inspections department exactly. and they issue them without any, us even knowing that it's happened. Yeah. Uh, so this one's obviously been brought to light by the citizens. The citizens uh, that are passionate about trying to save it are coming to the city council trying to put pressure on the county to either save it or make sure that they follow the law. Chief Judge Walter Broad is pretty much declaring, no, this is going to go down, don't question me, I know this as law. You're, I'm not saying fighting back, but you're making a point that, wait, Judge, it's not that black and white. That's correct. I mean, once again, as anybody, we make uh, sure that they follow all the steps and ordinances that we put in place, along with the state. We've adopted the international building codes, the state building codes, along with cities. And in there, it specifically says, in this case, that you need these uh, approvals. And so we uh, are standing by that we need those. Uh, he is uh, saying that he sent the applications in, or they did. He hasn't heard from 30 days. So if you don't hear from him in 30 days, it's all null and void, or mm -hmm. the default is it's OK. Uh, that's not the case, uh, the way that our city attorneys read it and uh, they still need it. So there's the differences of opinion on interpretation of the ordinances. Is this a place Rock Island City doesn't want to be? We do prefer not to be in this. Uh, once again, each municipality uh, it does their own thing. If we start meddling in the county stuff, it, it's not fair. They need to make the decisions. They've been in, uh, involved in the discussions of what needs to happen and everything else. We shouldn't be second guessing them as another uh, city municipality. And then just one more question this, and I know it's an odd question, just a, a pure economic question. Do you care if the courthouse stays or goes as far as the tax base is concerned? Because does it really make a difference whether it's a park or if it's a building? Because it's a government building, it's not paying taxes. If it's a government building or a park, it makes no difference to the city. That's what I was wondering. What makes the difference to the city the most is the, the view that it has. We don't want a boarded up, blighted building is a welcome way into the city. So that makes the biggest difference. The second was, if it was to go into private hands, then it does become property tax value, source of income for uh, sales tax, et cetera. Uh, so then it does make a difference to the city. Uh, but it appears that the county does not have a wish uh, to sell it to a private individual. Uh, they, it would either be a county building or no building. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily understand is that when you look at the difference between Moline's downtown and Rock Island's downtown is that you have churches, Moline does too, but you mm. have government buildings, you have nonprofits as well, but there are non-tax paying, non-property tax paying blocks in Rock Island that other cities don't have in Rock Island County. That's correct. And so that people see those, the churches and the hospital and that sort of thing, and a lot of times think they pay taxes and they don't. And Augustana College does not. Uh, and so that's a big footprint that a lot of them don't have. But you're proud to have them there. <laughs> Absolutely. They bring other, there's, this, there's the, the other side Absolutely. benefits with the professors and et cetera. The other thing that is bringing in taxes is, of course, industrial growth. And Rock Island had big announcements last year. GTI, $8 million. Ecogistics, $3 million. AgriSolutions, $900,000 as far as expansions is concerned. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're expecting in 2019 as well, or was this a bit of an aberration? You know what? I'm expecting more. 
How about that? No, I, you know, it, it is something we're expecting. Uh, we're working very hard at these uh, projects, and uh, we have a few more that uh, we were talking to some people. So we do anticipate equal to that, if not more, in 2019. Uh, now, whether it happens or not, we'll see, but that's my prediction. Uh, but the city staff and, and myself have been working very hard at making these things happen. Well, and you're seeing some new growth, but you also must be happy to be seeing some of the old go by. You think of the Norcross building, you think of the Case building. Mm -hmm. You think of basically the Centennial Expressway entryway, That's the correct. gateway into Rock Island, so to speak. Correct. Those buildings being gone. Uh, do you see that as a great area on the uh, west side of Rock Island for industrial expansion or greater green space or, or something that makes the city look a little better oh, when you're entering it? Absolutely. And, and in the case of Dorn tearing down the old case plant, uh, mm -hmm. case building, uh, they're actually investing multi-millions of dollars in that property, not just that, but in their office and everything else. So that increases the tax value of the, of the, of the site, it helps the city. It also helps them grow and add more jobs. So that's, that's very positive. Where Norcross is, uh, service rubber uh, is torn down, we've already had some people interested mm -hmm. in that site. So we hope that it doesn't stay green very long. Uh, we've got some people we're talking to that uh, would want to build some light manufacturing there. Um, now, whether those happen or not, still talking, but uh, let's get one thing first and get it torn down, get an eyesore out of there. But uh, it's also in an opportunity zone. The federal government put out there this year uh, a, 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 an advantage uh, a tool to help economic development called the Opportunity Zone, and that's in that zone. And so we now have that in a TIF, it's in an enterprise zone for uh, sales tax, and an Opportunity Zone. So we have a lot of tools to be able to help market those sites. One area that Rock Island's always been working on, especially over the last five years, is increasing retail, so that you have more retail tax collection as well. So naturally, I get back to 11th, <laughs> or I get back to Kmart as well, right. which is uh, about Black Hawk Road in that area. Right. Are those two areas still hot properties because we're not looking at big box stores anymore are we we're not looking at big box stores uh, yeah and, and they are i'll say they're still hot i mean rock island is limited in the retail corridors it has right and that's probably been the hardest product to, to try to to attract to, to rock island at this point has been retail sales we're kind of at a dead end and there's just not a lot of traffic uh traveling through like you see in john deere road or 53rd or cross 74. Uh, when you get those cars that draws retail and we just don't have that traffic and, and probably will never see that volume of traffic so it's a little more difficult and you got to be a little more of the rifle approach on who you try to track versus a shotgun mm -hmm. and just they're saying here it is yeah um, right. uh, the old Kmart building is now occupied or will be occupied by U-Haul right. unfortunately they do not generate any sales tax or very little uh, sales tax basically uh, a storage facility and a rental facility correct but it does keep the lights on they are going to they are committed to spending quite a bit of money and putting a new facade on putting a new parking lot in there and making it an attractive building and it will draw some traffic down that way to help the other retailers that are there 11th street we're still working on trying to uh, promote that and work with that uh, changing the concept instead of a big box can we get several uh, medium-sized type retails there grocery store would be a, an ideal situation uh, so we just haven't got that found the right individual yet. Because of the demolition, because of the uh, infrastructure work that was done in that area, is it making it more of a uh, appealable piece of property? Absolutely. No, I think that, uh, believe it or not, uh, two things is that by the city owning it at this point and uh, being taking the blight out of there, it makes it more attractive. People don't have to have that vision, so to speak. Uh, they can see uh, what potentially could be. I was reading about uh, some of the, the uh, budget issues and restraints that you have in the coming year. Mm -hmm. One of the things is that you are going to rethink uh, perhaps uh, uh, employees, the number of employees this, the mm -hmm. city has, also cutting back on certain services if they're not needed. And one of them, because of the timing right now, mm -hmm. could be changing your emergency snow route so that you don't necessarily have to plow as yeah. many streets as quickly as possible. Explain a little bit about what you're looking at right there because as you know, that can get the public angry. Absolutely, and, and obviously we don't want to. Uh, and, and you say that p eliminate people that we don't aren't needed. Everybody's needed. Right. The I'm, city, I apologize. That's but, right. But attrition this, that's or right. any type of and cutback. Because the city has has, has cut out uh, probably close to 40 individuals in the last eight to 10 years, uh, if not replaced. And so they've really worked her hard at reducing, if you want to call it fat, and and and, and helping productivity. Now we're down to the basics and the core services. And so we're having to take a look at, do we cut the number of snow routes and not be the you know, uh, best out there, so to speak? Uh, do we close a fire station? Uh, do we cut out ambulance service? Do we uh, change the way we collect garbage? I don't know, really don't, we're really, but those are the type of things we're having to dig into now and take a look is, can we do them more efficiently 
or do we have to cut the services and just not have that quality service? Frustration is you charge, or we're, you know, we have a, a fairly high property tax. People say, I'm paying a premium. I should get premium service. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, the expenses are going up far more faster than the revenues coming in. Um, and there's, a, there's several different reasons for that, whether it be the police and fire pensions. I'm not saying they don't deserve it, not saying that, you know, but the obligation is there. And that is a very heavy uh, load for the city to cover. Our expenses went up $1.3 million in 19, from 18 to 19 with doing nothing. Not adding any more bodies or anything else, just pay increases that had been negotiated, pension plans, et cetera, the obligation. $1.3 million went up. Our revenue didn't go up. It was flat. So where do you come up with that money? Guess what? 2020, that's going to happen again. And so if we don't do a combination of continue to try to get retail in here and new businesses, along with cutting some expenses, um, the, the future then becomes dimmer. I want to end with uh, a great event that's coming for Rock Island in April yes. when the national spotlight is on you. Thanks to the Rock Island Independence. Was that yes, it was. Yes, it was. How important is it to have the draft here in the Quad Cities, I think Rock Island in particular? I think it's very important. Uh, it, it helps put us on the map, so to speak. Uh, you know, a lot of people, when you talk to them that, uh, about the NFL, and they say, you know, what if and, and the NFL was here? Yeah. They really didn't know that there was a first game was played here. They always thought Canton, Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the uh, museum is and everything else. Um, and it, it just, it, it, it's a fact, and uh, it was a wonderful thing to have. It's going to help tourism. It's going to help put us on national uh, uh, recognition. Um, and so uh, it just is, is another positive thing that we have to show that Rock Island does do great things and has had some good history. Does it also mean that it's, you're very happy, the investment that was done in that neighborhood uh, for the park as well? Uh, I mean, you spruced up and now it's in perfect shape to welcome the nation. It, it is in real good shape. It's not I quite know it's gonna be held in Augustana, I apologize. Yeah, it, it's, in the, yeah it, it's, it's hosted, we're gonna, you know, we're, the city's hosting it. Yep, the draft. And, and we just picked, chose that, weather, uh, because of weather and everything Absolutely. else, uh, it helps that. And Douglas Park is, we've spent so much money on the, on the land and everything else, the turf and everything else. We don't want to be torn up by everybody right. there. Yeah. Um, and we're not done with Douglas Park, by the way. We're going to be putting, there'll be another, a, a minimum of uh, 250,000, if not more, put into that park this year um, uh, to help c continue to spruce it up, along with Martin Luther King Center has been mm -hmm. added on to. There's been some good housing starts down there. Uh, so that neighborhood's really looking good. Uh, but it, it does help uh, put a, a spotlight on it, uh, that area and uh, show that Rock Island is very diverse and, and, and has a lot to offer. Mayor Mike Tomes, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. The state of the city is? The city of Rock Island is financially solid, nice reserves, but we need to look forward to the, look at the future and make sure we stay that way. Thanks again, I appreciate it. Thank you. That's the mayor of Rock Island, Mike Tomes. In a moment, a look back at an iconic moment in Iowa history, but first here's Laura Adams, out and about. This is Out and About for January 28th through February 3rd. It's time for Big Brothers Big Sisters 14th Annual Putt Around at the River Center Great Hall. Norma Leah Ovarian Cancer Initiative invites you to its 8th Annual Cocos and Cookies Open House on February 2nd at the Norma Leah office in downtown Rock Island. Enjoy pancakes, sausage, and all the trimmings at the Geneseo Kiwanis Pancake Stay in the Moose Lodge on the 3rd. The Putnam opens a new exhibit, Race, Are We So Different? The exhibit aims to help people of all ages better understand the origins of race in everyday life. It's time for winter carnival fun at the Family Museum February 2nd. A free shuttle will be available to pick up and drop off at all locations all day long. Or join the sixth annual Have a Heart for the Homeless Luncheon at Jumers on February 2nd. Also on tap, the Winter Choral Concert featuring the Jenny Lynn Vocal Ensemble at Centennial Hall on the 2nd. Kinky Boots is coming to the Adler Theater January 30th. The Three Musketeers finish their swashbuckling run at the Bruner Theater Center through February 3rd. The Black Box Theater presents Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill, one of the last concerts by Billie Holiday before her death running through February 9th. And Disney's Newsies is currently on the main stage at Circa 21 Dinner Playhouse. For more information, visit WQPT.org.
Thank you, Laura. Musician David G. Smith doesn't shy away from the issues of the day. His music comes from the heart and touches on the issues that are important to him, such as the case of this song that he recorded for us at the Black Box Theater in Moline. It's about migration, the worldwide movement of people who uproot their lives and leave their homelands. It's called Mi Familia. Another migrant stuck in Nogales Shantytown, Mexican side Captured crossing the border A journey many have tried I feed them here in this comedor and Some of them I know by name when I ask them why they keep risking their lives, well, the answer is always the same. Me for me, me for me, my sisters, my brothers, the babies and mothers, me for me. At night, crossing the desert, drown in the Rio Grande. Violence and poverty chase them on their run for the promised land. And everyone who comes through here has a story and picture to show. Desperate lives framing hopeful eyes and telling me why they still go me familiar me familiar sisters my brothers the babies and mothers me Apart, but the children will break your heart, and I feed them every day because all of them are me, me, you, me, me, you, sisters, my brothers. Babies and mothers, me for me, me for me, sisters, my brothers, the babies and mothers, me for me. David G. Smith, Mi Familia, he'll be at Davenport's The Grape Life this coming Friday, February 8th for a little wine and song, as he's calling it. Now, we want to take you back to 1965. Iowa decided that all of its citizens needed a standardized education. That included the children who are educated in tiny one-room schoolhouses that dotted the state. and also included the Amish. When a Des Moines Register photographer took this picture of Amish children running into a central Iowa cornfield, it sparked an outrage scene nationwide. They were running from the state's enforcement of a law requiring these children to attend public schools, be mixed with non-Amish children to go against their culture and beliefs. On February 10th, WQPT will premiere a documentary looking back at that moment in 1965 and its social impact in the state and beyond. Joining us is Kelly Rundle of Fourth Wall Films, the people behind the Amish incident, as you are calling it. That picture is iconic. Tell me why you decided this was a topic that you wanted more people to know. 
I think the photo uh, represents one of those things that happens sometimes with a photo or sometimes it's video footage uh, that captures the public imagination. Uh, but we never really know all this, the, the story behind that story, all the details. So take us back to 1965 in Iowa. Mm -hmm. There was a belief that every child has to have what? Pretty much a standardized education. Some people are slipping through the cracks, as we might say in these days. Yes, there was a law, and specifically what led to this Amish incident was that the Amish were not using state certified teachers. And so uh, the uh, county officials were directed to enforce the law, and they began to try to figure out how to do that. And um, that ultimately is what led to what, what we think of as this incident where kids did run into the cornfield. And what, what was the cause of that? I mean, the, the children were actually told, run, get into the cornfield. Why was that? Well, I guess that's, that is the story. And what part of the story is that the Amish were uh, organized to some degree uh, behind the scenes. And this was a, a nonviolent act of civil disobedience uh, to protest the idea of uh, busing the kids into town schools. And this really, as far as the Amish was concerned, an attack on their way of life. This wasn't just, okay, education. This is their culture, the core of their beliefs in so many different ways. It was. They're very pro-education to a point, uh, and to the point that they feel is appropriate for their culture. So if I believe right, in 1965, they believed education up to eighth grade. Correct. Exactly. I mean, their standards were much different than, than I don't want to say normal. I, I don't they, say standardized. How's that? Correct. They were different. And uh, they felt that if the state controlled the details of what, how their children would be educated, that that was a threat to their religious freedom and also to their culture as well. Now, so this documentary has been a labor of love, a work that you've done that was, you, you started it well, less than about 45 years later, did you notice that there were still real strong emotions in regards to this issue? There were. In fact, the two gentlemen that we interviewed both had very strong feelings about it for different reasons. Um, but the um, uh, Mr. Lemon, who was the uh, county attorney at that time, still felt very strongly that the Amish should not have been granted an exemption. Um, the reporter, uh, Raffensperger, who we talked to, uh, he just felt it was a great story all around. And I think for us, too, as we began to think about how to tell the story, we discovered it's as, as much a story about journalism as it is about this conflict with the Amish. How do you see that? Well, the photograph is the result of the reporting on that. And the conflict that was occurring wasn't really going anywhere productive until that photo was published and it became a kind of a sensation. Well, then the governor got involved, and very quickly they began to talk and to find a way to compromise, uh, you know, to get past that conflict. It was interesting because I was reading a, a Des Moines Register article on about the 50th anniversary of yeah. that photograph where they were talking to the superintendent at the time who almost yes. has regret yes. he would not have done it this way. You know, did you notice that a lot when you were talking to people is that you look back and go, yeah, this was not the way we should have handled this. Yes, there were at least a couple of people who expressed that and particularly, as you say, Art Censor, and he says that in the film. He talks about what he would have done differently knowing what he knows now. Uh, and of course, we all have those feelings about things from the past. But in a way, that's what's good about looking back at an incident like this. Um, it does show us a way that uh, it isn't always an all or nothing situation, that sometimes both parties can be satisfied by, uh, through dialogue and compromise. Was it somewhat a surprise looking back when you, when you did the reportage? Were people surprised that it did capture the national mood at the time, that it, that it did catch on from coast to coast? I think it was a, a surprise. Uh, although I think people are fascinated by the Amish, mm -hmm. and so it had that quality to it. Um, but this is the beginning of people beginning to think about having more say about how their kids are, are educated. And so it just was uh, a circumstance, a coincidence, I guess you might say. Yeah, because it was almost like a homogenizing of society back, you know, from the 50s into the 60s. And now when you look at today's world, today's education system, or even today's culture and society, it's quite the opposite. It's like we're, we're celebrating our uniqueness, and that makes us part of the whole. Not so much back then? 
Uh, I would say that's, that's true. And you know, there were some Amish people, Amish people don't like conflict, number one. So if they find they're in an area where there is conflict, they'll eventually move out. Some people left early in that conflict and went to uh, Wisconsin, where they became involved in the Wisconsin Amish incident that led to a US Supreme Court case uh, kind of settling uh, the issue in favor of the Amish. What do you hope that the viewer will get from this? I mean, today, it, it's, it, I think sometimes it's very easy for us now to look back and go, tisk, 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 tisk. Because right. we weren't alive back then, right. and hindsight is, what, 2020. Right. What do you hope the viewer gets today? I think it's just the idea that we can resolve conflict through dialogue and through compromise. This is a great example of that happening. Uh, and of a lot of different parties coming together to, to do that, to resolve that. Uh, and we, we always have conflicts uh, at local level, at state level, at the national level, and it shows a way to, to work our way through that, I think. Once again, it's airing as a premiere on WQPT this month, February mm -hmm. 10th, but you've already premiered it in front of an audience uh, in, in, in mid-Iowa. What was the reaction to that? Well, we previewed it in Independence, Iowa, in a theater there. Uh, so this was ground zero for that story. So we found, like we've found with other films, where, where you show it in the area where it happened, it's right. different. And so the feelings are still kind of strong and, and uh, in the same way they were in the 60s. Were you surprised by that reaction or not so? A, a little bit, but we've done it before. And so whenever <laughs> you're showing a film in that area, it's not really the general audience that you'll get elsewhere. And the feelings are strong, well, how do you mean? I mean, what, was somebody saying you depicted my family wrong or that's not the way it happened or, no. gee, I wish you would have done more on this area? No, it's just that, uh, for example, at the screening there was a, an elderly woman who was a teacher and she just expressed the fact that she still thought the Amish should not have been granted an exemption. And I think that is the way some people feel. Kelly Rundle from uh, Fourth Wall Films, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We do want to remind you the Amish incident airs at 9 o'clock Thursday, February 10th, right here on WQPT. WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military. And WQPT wants to help support service men and women returning home from active service. Coming back to civilian life brings new challenges and opportunities. The Veterans Coming Home program helps connect veterans to resources and services that can be a help to you. You can find out more information by going to WQPT.org. Click on Embracing Our Military to learn more on the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities.